Great. Thank you. Well, hi, everyone. Let's open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for the reality, the truth of Yeshua and uh, who it says, Paul says, in him, we live, we move, and we have our being. So thank you, Lord, that he is in us and we are in him. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the promises that we have, your word. Thank you that it's a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Enlighten us more and more as we study, as we open ourselves up to you. In Yeshua's name, amen. Well, great to be with you from Knoxville, Tennessee. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, it's great to be here. And I'm seeing so many faces. Uh, uh, some new ones. Kathy. Hey, Kathy from Toledo. I met Kathy two weeks ago at a Messianic congregation there. It was great. There's Tammy. We met on the way to um, from. Uh, uh, where was I? Oh, gosh, I've my mind. Uh, somewhere there, somewhere in Texas, yeah, from Houston. I was in Houston last weekend, drove Beth, about Beth six Messiah. hours. Yeah, Beth Messiah. Yep. Faith yeah. is here. <laughs> yep, exactly. And uh, so I'm here for the weekend in Knoxville. This is my last weekend here. And then on Tuesday, I'm heading back to Israel. I'm ready. I've I've had a great time. Uh, it's been refreshing, um, even though extremely busy, but it's been good connecting with people, new people, bringing an awareness more and more to what's happening in Israel, uh, trying to raise support for our prayer meeting. Our prayer meeting is on fire at the moment. Simon and Yaron are a big part of that. And what they're doing as well, uh, this project up in the north. And uh, I think pretty well, I don't know, at least half of you here I've been able to meet along the way. Uh, Catherine, Gary, um, and if I'm and there's uh, Troy, and if there's any others that I've missed out, Marilyn, of course, and Lynette. So, guys, we are on. Uh, we are up to Deuteronomy 21. Now, for those that are new, we're going through the cycle of the Torah, the five books of Moses, and we are coming to the end. Another few weeks, we'll be starting Genesis again, and this is all about our journey. This is where we're, we're uh, journeying with the Israelites. As we study God's word, we're entering into their experience. It's like when you read a book. When you read a book, you're, you're entering into that experience. So the more we study, the more we analyze it from a historical, social, cultural, literary background, the more it will make sense, the more understanding we will get. And most importantly, uh, the more we will be able to connect with Yeshua and get more and more revelation of who he is or who he was, who he is, and who he will be. And we're just getting started, guys. We're just, when you think you're getting deeper, it just doesn't stop. So this is the beauty of God's word. I rejoice in your word as one who finds great treasure. So today our theme is from chapter 21, Deuteronomy, from verse 10 which says, and it's called Ki Tetzeh, for when you go forth to war against your enemies, when you go out. So this is about war. This is about uh, going out to fight. Now, remember what I said. Some Sometimes uh, we don't like that word, fighters. You know, we want to we wanna be loving. We want to turn the cheek. We want to uh, let us reason together, says the Lord. Absolutely. And amen. But sadly, uh, we're in a war. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, remember, and I keep reverting to this as a reminder to us, when they came out of Egypt, they were stripped of practically any and every identity that they had. Think about it. They had this identity when they were in Egypt. And what was that identity? They were slaves. They were the people of Israel. But what did that really mean to them? They were the people of Israel. Big deal. Who, who cares when you're in bondage? The, all they had was a, was a thread, a string of hope that one day they would get delivered. Well, God delivered them, brought them out into the uh, wilderness. There they are. And now they're no longer slaves. So they've had to leave that behind. 
the, the all that structure that they had in Egypt, that's gone. Now, what are they doing? Can you imagine being in that crowd in that wilderness? They're not in the promised land yet. They're in this no man's land. And you and I are going to find ourselves in that situation time and time and time again. And God wants us to continually empty ourselves, be totally empty. Why? This is the this is getting rid of the old wineskins. This is so he can pour new wine into us. And it, it's a vulnerable place. It's an empty place, but it is a good place to be. So uh, now they go from being slaves. And then remember in the book of Numbers that we just finished, God says all 20-year-olds and over step up for warfare. You are going to be enlisted in the idea of the Israeli defense forces. We are going into the land of Canaan. We're going to go and do some fighting. So whether you like it or not, everyone, whether the Israelites liked it or not, they had to step up. God began counting them. Remember that phrase, a really interesting phrase. It says they began to count the people by name, a very unusual statement. You usually, um, when you say you count people, you count them by numbers. But it says he began to count them by name. I can't remember that reference. But uh, then, not only names, but by families, then by their tribes, then by the nation. So the importance of having a good identity as an individual within our family, and that may mean a spiritual family like a church as well. Then our tribe, that may also mean our community, our congregation, here, our Bible study. And then as a people, who do we who do we identify as a nation and as a people? And uh, that's a whole different talk in itself. But letting God redefine who we are time and time again. And we have many identities. That was a new one for the Israelites being soldiers. Then a little bit later, he said, those that are 30 years old, you step forward. I want you to be my priests. So isn't that interesting? A, a, a kingdom of priests, a kingdom of fighters. And when they came out of Egypt, God said they, it says in God's word, they came out as an army. So uh, who, can you identify with anything I've just shared, anyone? Do you have your identity more and more as a single, as a person within your family, within your tribe or community, and then within your nation? These are really important as we go forward. But we're focusing on now, chapter 21, when you go out to war. Now the focus is on war. So uh, they've got a report back from the spies that there's giants in the land, there's fortified city. It's a land that eats its inhabitants. But now it's a new generation. That old generation had died. Guys, we've got a, this is, that old generation stands for that old wine. The fear, the, the mistakes in our past. Remember, the Israelites had a big mistake in their past. What happened at Mount Sinai? Their their idolatry, their impatience when they saw that Moses wasn't coming down. They had to leave that behind, that old generation. And that's what we've got to learn to do. If we're going to go forward to fight or to be priests, we've got to constantly strip this off, leave it in the wilderness. That's why we, when we studied the book of Numbers, one of our studies was when they took the ashes outside of the camp. Now, those ashes speak of death. Anything associated with death had to be taken out of the camp. Guys, we got to get rid of de de deadly emotions, deadly feelings, deadly memories. And we got to take it to the altar and leave it there. And any remains, take it outside of the camp. And then we rise up in the spirit, cleansed with our armor on, and we go out to fight. Now, like I said, the Israelites, whether they liked it or not, they had a battle on their hands. And whether you and I like it or not, 
we are in a battle. You know, thinking thinking about it, this is something that we should be taught when we're little kids, that life is not a bed of roses. And, you know, let's work our way up the ladder of success and get a, a higher paying job and all of that. There's nothing wrong with all of that. But really, life is a battle. As Job said, he said, as sparks fly upward, so is man born for trouble. <laughs> How depressing. <laughs> as sparks fly upward, so is man born for trouble. Guys, it's hard being a human being. It's a very complex thing being a human being. Uh, but that's it. And we are fighting all the days of our lives. What are we fighting? What kind of things are we fighting? Well, you know the old saying, the, the, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and that's for sure correct. The world, the things of the world that we're, we're that, that have hooks all around us, just like the Israelites going into Canaan, a, 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 a land filled with idolatry and Canaanite practices with all these hooks and all the gods, the gods of Baal and Molech, which are connected to agriculture, are connected to strength, are connected to the, the climate, the weather. And if you follow after the ways of the peoples, you're going to get blessed. That's That was their beliefs. So the Israelites, they didn't know what they were going into there, but that's what these, these were the hooks that were waiting for the Israelites. Traps. Just like our soldiers right now, everyone, uh, who are about to go into South Lebanon, there's traps waiting. There's, uh, there's soldiers, snipers waiting. Uh, so, um, and then there's, so there's the world, the, the devil and his devices. I've just been focusing a little bit on the book of Acts, where if you read the book of Acts, Luke, he says, on one hand, he says, the spirit did not allow us to go this way. And then in another sentence, he says, the, the devil resisted us, Satan resisted us, and trying to discern, you know, what is the Lord saying no, what is the devil, uh, what is just our own discernment and our own common sense. So the world, the devil, and the flesh, this is probably one of the hardest things to fight against, our own flesh, the good inclinations and the negative inclinations the tree of life that we're running towards and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is tasty, pleasant to the eyes. Notice these things I've been touching on recently, our senses, our five senses, our eye gate, our ear gate, our taste, our smell and our touch. And these are all physical and yet um, there is a spiritual application to all of these uh, areas. For your information, even the Muslims uh, know what I'm talking about, that we're in, we're in a battle, we're in a fight. They call it jihad. They have what's called an internal jihad and an external jihad. Of course, we all know what they mean by an external jihad, fighting against people like you and me. In their eyes, we are the Canaanites and they are the Israelites. They are the, the chosen people and we are the enemy. Christians and Jews, but they also believe in an internal jihad where you're fighting internally those demons. And the, the, by the way, the uh, Arabic word for demon is jinn, jinn, where we get the word genie. And so they know all about that internal fight. And that's why you'll see many of them um, living a very modest uh, uh, non-materialistic life, except for the three leaders of Hamas who are all billionaires living in Qatar. But that's another story. They seem to have a license to do that. And then ultimately, guys, we are fighting against darkness. Our fight in the 21st century, it is becoming clearer and clearer that we are fighting. It's, it's light against darkness. It's truth against lies the father of all lies. And by the way, some, you know what I, I call lies as well? Half truths. Beware of the half truths, everyone. This is what the Lord called leaven. 
a little bit of leaven leavens the whole dough. This is where we have to be like cows, okay? Everyone, I want you to be a cow this morning. That doesn't mean I want you to moo, but I want you to have four stomachs. Cow has four stomachs where it digests food over and over and over and over. We have to be discerning. We have to chew over what we see and hear and what we're listening to. We have to... This is uh, what we what's called discernment, and that's been for that reason. The Lord in the last days He kept on saying, "Be not deceived, be not deceived." I was deceived this week in Houston. A, a guy scammed me. I got on the internet. I needed to rent a car, so what did I look for? Hertz. I saw a link that said Hertz. I pressed the link. I phoned the number. The guy was charming, professional. He directed me here. He, I gave him my credit card details. When I arrived at the Hertz place, there was no car. There was no name. There was nothing except my red, embarrassed, humiliated face. And they all said, quickly, phone the credit card company. They helped me. They were one. They said, you're about the, the 10th or 11th person recently that this, this same thing has happened to Fortunately, uh, the money had not gone out. They put a, a hold on my credit card. But I was aware as I was talking to him, my host, he said, it smells a little fishy here. And I was, you know, I was trying to, and I was asking questions. What a charmer. What a charmer. And uh, he got me. But thankfully, uh, the money didn't go out. So, uh, and there's so many other areas that we're fighting for, fighting for justice, fighting for justice. This is a big key thing in these days. So much injustice and uh, double standards and false accusations. One of the things that the Lord said in the last days would happen more and more, he said, many will be offended, offended. Uh, this is a huge thing, you know, in this woke generation, just about anything you say now, people get offended by. Uh, remember, I pointed out now that you can't even relate to an animal without someone being offended, meaning you can't even say I'm as hungry as a horse. Because people say, well, that could offend horses. Serious. <laughs> you know, you're as snow as a snail or a, or a tortoise. No, 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 you can't say that. It's going to offend the animals. So uh, it's this woke generation. Many, many people are offended. And you and I have to fight against us being offended. You know, a lot of the time we take on offenses, people actually don't genuinely mean to offend us. Some things come out wrong. Sometimes we misinterpret tones. Um, or we don't know what people are going through. You know, uh, I just heard a case recently uh, at a work situation. This girl, she's been acting a little bit um, nasty. And it came out that she had a miscarriage recently. And um, she didn't share that with anyone. Perhaps she should have. But going through her grief, it affected her behavior. So we don't know what people are going through. And so we need to be careful. We need to guard our hearts and fight. When you go out to fight, this is a fight, not to take offenses. And somehow, remember Acts 28, everyone, when Paul was bitten by a snake, what does it say? He shook it off. He shook it off. I heard a, a sermon by a Messianic Jew. Uh, it was called Shake It Off. And he must have said it about 30 times during his message. Shake it off. Wherever, whatever's bitten you that has tried to poison you, shake it off. Get it out. Move forward. So, um, so again, the sense of uh, fighting against justice. If you look in Deuteronomy 22.2, this is on our notes. It says, you shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep go astray and hide yourself from them. 
you shall in any case bring them again unto your brother. You know, sin is not just doing bad things. Sin is not stepping up and doing the right things. This is where we need strength, everyone. These days, if we're going to make an impact on the spirit of the world, we're going to need a new strength. We're going to need new wine. In myself, I am weak. Like Paul, when he came to Corinth, he said, when I was with you, I came to you in weakness, timidity, and trembling. He knew in himself he didn't have what it took. So um, when in Deuteronomy 22, 2, if you see your brother's ox fall, uh, sorry, go, go or sheep, go astray, what do you do? Do you, do you just sit back and let it happen and hide yourself from them? Hiding. What does that remind us of, everyone? Hiding. Adam in the Garden of Eden. He hid behind those fig leaves. When we're living in fear, shame, guilt, condemnation, we are hiding. And it holds us back from freedom and stepping up to be soldiers and priests. We got to strip off those leaves. So we can't hide and shirk responsibility. And I'm telling you, in these last days, when we see our brother go astray, instead, in this case, it's a sheep or an ox go astray. We can see our brothers and sisters go astray, or we can see them in trouble. We Somehow, we need to stand with our brothers. Uh, and this is fighting. This takes strength. This takes uh, conviction. And sometimes, everyone, a cost. It can cost us, cost us dearly because, uh, well, depending on what the situation. But sometimes um, to stand up for people and fight for people and fight for causes. What did I read yesterday? Was it here in the United States or was it England? Uh, or was it Australia? Somewhere I read around the world now, it's they're putting a ban from or 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 they're they're um they're monitoring preaching in the pulpits now in uh, in churches. If anyone knows what I'm talking about, I just read it yesterday. Uh, now the 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 government are saying we can come into your churches and monitor what you are saying. Now, here in the United States, it's really interesting that there are some churches, they will speak what what they want from the pulpit, and they're not afraid. Meaning, uh, I heard a, a message, someone just sent me uh, yesterday, a message about politics, and, um, uh, and the whole issue of should should preachers and pastors preach politics from the pulpit it's a it can be very controversial in many churches some churches they don't want to hear that in some churches it can split churches because you've got left wing right wing in those churches but this preacher actually was quoting a number of sermons way back from the days of George Washington so they they were legitimate back then and um and Jesus he Yeshua preach politics, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. That's politics. Um, Paul talked about submitting to rules and, and, and authorities. In the book of Acts, it says we are we better uh, rather obey God than man. They wouldn't keep silent. So, But, of course, we need wisdom. We need sensitivity as we uh, do this. But the point that I'm trying to make, guys, is that there are causes all around us, our brothers, we see our, our our sheep, our ox, our donkey. And in our case, when we see people uh, go astray or fighting for causes, how do we, what's our reaction? I mean, sometimes it's just a matter of prayer. Sometimes we can't do anything. Uh, sometimes it's an opportunity for us to step up and not hide. This is a big topic here, everyone, and and I'm not taking it lightly, and I'm not putting any guilt or undue pressure on anyone here, because you have to ask the Lord. You have to pray individually 
where, how, when uh, you can step up and uh, fight for whatever cause it is. Then the fight, <clears throat> I started off the message fighting for our identity. This is something that you and I, and, and I was talking with someone just the other day, when, especially if we've come from, you know, uh, abusive, um, broken backgrounds, marred images, you know, where our, our identity has been uh, broken by our upbringing. And we're constantly fighting the inner thoughts of who we are. Now, look what it says in Deuteronomy 22.5. It says, the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So there you go, guys. I'm sorry to say we're not allowed to wear dresses. Um, and by the way, this, this point has, has been and still is taken to an extreme. Let me give you an example. When Israel became a nation in 1948, and our our army was so small, we were, we we needed women and children to fight. When some of the religious men saw women with guns, they quoted this verse because it's not just about clothes. Everyone, uh, let me re requote the verse. Deuteronomy 22.5, the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. So if you interpret that word wear, um, that can cover so many things. Wearing can be your behavior. It's like when someone says to you, you don't have to wear that. Someone calls you a name, you don't have to wear that. You could shake it off. So when these women had guns, the men looked at it and they said, that's wrong. M guns are for men. They're not for women. And their their justification was from the Bible. Because in the Bible, it only says men that are 20 years old are to step up for, for the for the physical fight. Today it's men and women where because we're all fighting together. The like I said, the the flesh, the world, the devil, ourselves, and in prayer, we're fighting in prayer. But uh uh in the physical this is an example where the, the, the men said, this is wrong. This is making you out to be, you know, this is an appearance of a man. Uh, I heard a story of uh, someone that was married to someone Scottish. And they turned up at the wedding and uh, all the men were wearing kilts. But that was different because a kilt isn't exactly a, a feminine dress it's a very manly one underneath you have a dagger you have a bottle of whiskey um, i've actually worn a kilt when i was in sterling scotland once and it was fun it was it's a very it's very heavy material by the way so um but that's different so it, it's it's that word wearing the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. Now we could talk a lot about this transgenderism. I don't think we need to go there today. I think we 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 uh, we get that point. But in so many other fields, and it's not just a gender issue. It's like I was saying before. And 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 by the way, the 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 context that this is writing is it's a, called a mixture. Everyone, it's a mixture because. In the context of Deuteronomy 22, it talks about don't mix wool with cotton. Don't plow a field with a with a, a sheep and an ox. Don't mix. Don't bring confusion. Uh, uh, this, is, this is called separating. Now, why is this important? Because of one key word, assimilation. Assimilation. When the Israelites come into the land of Canaan and you become friendly with someone, you, let's say you go down to the market, you sell your olives or you sell your salt or you sell your dates and you've got a regular customer, um, you know, Maha uh, Hilabashli from the uh, Hittites. I just made up that name, but it sounds more Indian than Hittitish. But anyway, 
and you become friends. You, you're, you're trading with them all. And then all of a sudden, he introduces you to something. He's got a great idea that works in his agricultural fields, and you've been given God's word. And so the, 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 the protection about assimilation in the land, and again, that's a huge topic. The, for the Judeo-Christian world, for the Jews, for the Christians, and actually for the Muslims, uh, assimilation is a big enemy. Being in the world, but not of the world. Using television, using media, using cell phones for good, but w when does it cut in to our spiritual life? When does it affect our senses for negative and when does it help our senses for the positives? We're fighting for our identity, everyone. This is this is something we've got to guard against and the mixing, the mixing here. And you know, our our uh, our portion is when you go out to fight. Here's an interesting question I want to ask us. When is it? us that goes out to fight and when is it that the lord goes out to fight when is it that we're fighting and when is it that the lord is fighting and i've used these two illustrations many times moses was lifting up the rod over the red sea god split the red sea but moses had to lift up the rod moses lifted up his arms with the help of aaron and ur and when he did so, Israel were winning. But when he dropped his arms, God didn't give the victory. So who won the, the victory? Was it God or was it Moses and Aaron and Ur? And I think the answer is both. At the uh, Lifting up the arms, lifting up the rod, that is symbolic, in my opinion, of prayer, of being, in a sense, in the place of being helpless, being in the place of only God can do this. And I've me I mentioned this actually the other week when I was preaching in, in, a, in a, I can't remember. But I said, and I was actually quoting Mother Teresa when she talked about prayer. She said, when we're in that zone of prayer, because she didn't use the word zone, but you know, you know what she meant. When, she's, when we're in that zone of prayer, that's the place where we are helpless, where we are haven't got what it takes to change history, to change God, to change the circumstance. All we can do is pour out our complaint, our prayer to the Lord in that zone. Now, what do we do? We leave that prayer behind and then we go as we are sensing the leading of the Lord's spirit. If we feel that we're at that place after we've prayed and lifted up our rod and lifted up our arms, if we feel that we need to do something active, like fight for justice, stand up, not hide, then we go, we move forward, we fight. But if we don't feel in our discerning, then we've just got to sit back and say, okay, God, you, you've you got to do everything. So this is something that we all have to work out. That's what Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to both to do and uh, and accomplish. So that's this is something you and I will constantly be fighting, but it begins, here's where the fight begins, everyone, on our knees. That's where the fight begins. That's why the Lord said in the Garden of Gethsemane, watch, not just watch, and pray. I get the watching, but the praying for me is where I need to really step up. He didn't just say watch. He said pray. And why did he say pray? Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. As we're praying, it's kind of like we're getting the oil for our lamps. We're getting the, the, the fuel that we need. So it's the watching and the praying that we need. This is fighting, everyone. This is battling. This is equipping us, us and God, to do the fight. And then, of course, and this is, this is in, in connection to what I was talking about before, fighting against justice uh, and also against cruelty and unkindness. In Deuteronomy 22.6, 
If a bird's nest chances to be before you in the way in any tree or on the ground, whether you whether they be young ones, young birds, or eggs, and the dam sitting under the young, the damsel sitting under the young or upon the eggs, you shall not take the dam with the young, meaning don't take the mother. But, verse 7, you shall in any wise let the dam go, and you can take the young, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest prolong the, thy days. Now, it's a little kind of confusing, meaning if you come across a bird's nest, you see the mother with the eggs or the little chicks. God is saying you can actually take the eggs and the chicks, but you're not to take the mother. Now, even that sounds a little bit cruel. Well, the 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 idea is uh, the mother, you're not to take away her ability to be fruitful because that mother still has a chance in life to bring life into the world. So, um, and this is just a simple little example in the scriptures that God is using through nature to teach us little basic truths in life about kindness, about being, uh, not being cruel. And we can learn a lot from animals, can't we? You know, the way we see a, a cat up in a tree. You've, you've seen videos or, or, or movies about firemen who leave everything and the whole street is around watching this all, all of this expense and time just for a little cat. But when they've got that cat, uh, because it's stuck up in the tree or the, the there's a fire going, and then they bring that cat down. Everyone cheers because it's such an act of kindness. I love watching videos of stray dogs or deserted dogs. And, you know, you see them and they're, they're, they're skin and bones and or they're growling because they've been so hurt and abused and they won't let you get near them. But then the people that are rescuing them, they, they earn their trust. They, 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 um, it takes time. They, they put, put a little bit of food. And then after a day or two, you see the dog's tail wagging. And then by the end of the video, they're lapping at, and they're sitting in their lap. You know, it, it's so precious. This is, uh, teaches us through the animal world about being kind and not cruel. But guys, what about human relationships? Sometimes it's easier with animals, right? I'm sure we can testify to times when you try to get near someone that's hurt and they're the same. They want to bite your hand off. And so in the same vein, in the same way, we can learn. And the Lord talked about this in the New Testament in Luke 14, verse 1. This is in page 2 in your notes. And it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day that they watched him. And behold, by the way, notice it says they watched him. They were watching. They were, they were looking to trip him up. And behold, there was a certain man, him which had the dropsy. And Jesus answered, said to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful for he to heal on the Sabbath? And they held their peace. They held their peace. And he took him and healed him and let him go. This was on the Sabbath. And answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things. And he put forth a parable to those who were bidden. When he marked how they chose out the chief room, saying unto them, When you are bidden to, to a wedding, don't sit down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than you be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and come and say unto thee, give this man place. And you begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when you are bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room or the lowest seat. That when he that invited you to come, he may say to thee, friend, come up higher. Then you shall have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever 
exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And he and said he also to them, when you make a dinner or a supper, don't call your friends or your brothers or your kinsmen or your neighbors or, that are rich, lest they come again to you and recompense thee. But when you have a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, that and you shall be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Guys, what this is talking about, this is talking about our motives. See, notice the Lord gets to the root of it. How can anyone be so angry that you broke the Sabbath and not happy that this poor man was healed. It just shows how a spirit of religion can get in. This is what I call cultic practices in the church. Cultic practices where people use scripture and it, it supersedes human relationships. I'll say that again. People use scripture that somehow supersedes human relationships. The Lord broke through all of this and he talks and that's why he goes into it and saying that they, they want to sit in the nicest places. They want to be greeted in the markets because he's getting to the root of, of why if, you, if you're in a cultic situation, ask yourself, what are people's motives uh, is there a pride issue? Is there a um, self-seeking motive here? So, um, <clears throat> and then in our passages in Deuteronomy 22.9, again, I touched on this, the issue of holiness and not mixing and not assimilating. Deuteronomy 22.9 at the top of page three, thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with various seeds lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. Thou shalt not wear a garment of diver sorts as of woolen and linen together. So for your information, the different crops become common at different times. The rule about the ox and the ass may rest partly on the ground of humanity, the step and the pull of the two creatures being so very unlike. So did you get that point? If you have an ox and an ass plowing together, they 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 plow with different steps. Uh, and an ox has a far longer step. An ass has a, a, a what's a different name for an ass? A, a donkey. Donkey. Has, thank you. Yeah. He has, they have different steps. So they're doing it at different times, different pace. It's kind of cruel. It's 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 unfair for the animals, um, which is a which which is a really interesting point. And Paul talks on this when he says in Second Corinthians six, "Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers." I would I would add to that not only being unequally yoked with unbelievers, but be discerning about being unequally yoked with believers as well. The ox was a clean animal and fit for sacrifice. The ass was unclean and must be redeemed with the lamb. The clean and the unclean must not till the holy land of Jehovah together. All these precepts are part of the laws of holiness in Leviticus, rules of behavior arising from the fact that Israel is the special people of a holy God. So I just touched on that briefly. There's a whole lot in the Torah about this, but you know, I think for us who are going through the, the the five books of Moses, isn't it good that we're touching on these verses that normally we most people they don't touch on. They they don't think it's applicable to our our uh, our world, but it's very applicable. We need uh, wisdom and discernment. Who we are laboring with, who we are plowing with, who we are working with, and sometimes. It's almost impossible to get out of a situation. We feel like we're doing all the quote unquote donkey work and others, they're shirking their responsibilities at times. 
That's a tough one. And somehow we've got to work through that. And um, that's too big a topic to go into. And then in Deuteronomy 22.12, we're talking now about the tzitzit, the fringes on the garments. Let's just say a few words about that. Then thou shalt make the fringes upon the four quarters of thy vesture, wherewith thou coverest thyself. By the way, this has been a traditionally male thing to do. Uh, but today with reform and liberal Judaism, a lot of women, they put on the tzitzit, the fringes as well. Uh, <clears throat> now, these are called in Hebrew tzitzit, and they are specially knotted ritual fringes or tassels worn in antiquity by Israelites and today by observant Jews primarily. The word tzitzit is translated tassels in most of our Bibles. Each tassel has eight threads when doubled over and five sets of knots totaling 13. The sum of all numbers is 613. And uh, they say that there are 613 laws in the uh, Torah. Traditionally, the number of commandments. This reflects the concept that donning a garment with tzitzit reminds its wearer of all Torah commandments as specified in Numbers 15.39. And in this verse here, Deuteronomy 22.12, thou shalt make the fringes upon the four corners. So I don't wear them. I don't think Gary wears them as a as a uh, as someone Jewish as well. Um, I'm not against them. In fact, I'm really for them. I, I at times I've thought about wearing them myself. I didn't grow up with them, um, but uh, I I don't see any negativity about it. Quite the opposite. I see it as a very positive thing. It's an outward reminder of God's laws and commandments. <clears throat> and whatever it takes, everyone, whatever. You know, a mezuzah on the doorpost, that's the same idea to remind us when we go in and out of our houses to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. These are just, they're, they're not uh, uh, emulets. Emulets are where we put power in these objects, okay? Remember that statement, it's a very important statement. Emulets are where we actually put power and superstition in these things. For example, if you put a mezuzah over your door, if you wear tzitzit, and you go out there, you do the door, and you say, ah, I'm protected, I'm wearing my tzitzit. No, you're not. You can't use that. It's like people that wear crosses. There's nothing wrong with wearing a cross if you believe that, uh, or rather, it reminds you of what Yeshua did for us. But if you go out of the door saying, I've got a cross, I'm protected, that's wrong. That is, that's called an emulet, that's superstition. Uh, you know, that's just imagine if someone grabbed your uh, neck and accidentally pulled that cross off. Does that mean you're no longer protected? You, we, you know, we're, we're forbidden. The, remember the hamsa, the five hand thing that everyone in Israel, when you go around shops, you see, in itself, there's nothing wrong with it, but most people wear it as an emulet, a rabbit's foot, things like this. Now, for your information, everyone, Yeshua himself, he wore tzitzit. He wore these fringes. There was a time uh, when the, a woman had the, the issue of blood. Do you remember those of you who have been to Israel? Do you remember when we went to the Jesus boat, that little museum? at Kibbutz Ginosa, and most of us go for a, a boat ride there. And uh, that was the place that this story happened. In the New Testament, it's called the Ginnaseret. Today, it's called Ginosa, from two Hebrew words, Gan, Sa. Gan means a garden. Sa means a prince. The garden of the princes who were the Maccabees. They owned those gardens. But in Luke, this is top of page four, Luke 8, 43, <clears throat> Now, a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all of her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately, her flow of blood stopped. Now, my question is this. Did she touch the corner of his garment simply because it was Yeshua himself? 
Or did she touch the corner of the garment because of his seat seat, his fringes? And in a way, she knew he was a man of God. She knew that he was the connection, like the ladder in Jacob's dream. That by it's like it's like going forward to a uh, a man of God, a priest, a minister, a pastor. You're not putting your trust in that pastor, but you know that he's your he he is a uh, a a um, a representative of being able to get to the Lord. There's nothing wrong with that. He's a mediator. He's a priest. And um, and maybe she did it because of she saw the seat seated. She understood that a man that wore the seat seat, the fringes, he was a man of God, and uh, she and he offered her hope. After all, other people were getting healed. Other people were were talking about him. Or did it? Or was it the fact that she touched the hem of his garment because it was Yeshua? She knew who he was. I don't think she had full revelation of who he was but maybe she started to hear some of the rumors. Uh, Mark 6, 56. Wherever he entered the villages, cities, or in the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made whole. So, um, you know, and, and by the way, like I said, these gar these seat seat they can be used in a in a godly righteous way, but they can also be used in a negative way. Look what happens in Matthew twenty three five in the middle of page four. Look what the Lord said about what Yeshua said to the Pharisees. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries. This is what we're talking about. The phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to, and to be called by men, rabbi, rabbi. So uh, this is, um, again, the, 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 the balance between a, a, a biblical truth, a biblical promise, wearing the seat seat, not putting your trust and your faith in it, but what it represents. And it's like you. You and I, we are representatives of the Lord. We've got to make sure that people don't put all of their trust in us as people um, so that we become the, the vessel of healing. No, we are just, we are like a, 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 a garment. We are a, 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 it's almost like a bridge, a bridge between God and man. And that's what a priest is. A priest is a, is, is a vicar. The word vicar from the word vicarious, on behalf of. That's our role. So um, now, guys, here's the great news about the the uh, the tzitzit, the fringes. There's a messianic prophecy in Malachi 4, verse 2. It says, but unto you who fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. The Hebrew word wings, knafayim, is the same word used for the tassels or the, the garments, the corner, the corner. They're, they're like wings. And this is a messianic prophecy. And that's what happened to this woman. She touched the corner of his garment. But unto you who fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And guys, you and I can do that by faith. We can see the Lord. 2,000 years ago through the eyes of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And by faith, we can reach out and touch the corner of his garments, which is him. It's him. He's wearing the garments. He's connected to those garments. He's the healer. He's the divine uh, doctor healer. So kind of coming towards the uh, end, <clears throat> but let me say a few more things about the Israelites who are, who are told when you go to war, when, when the Israelites were about to cross over the Jordan, who can tell me what weapons they had? Did they have, it wasn't, it, well, it was by this stage, it was the Iron Age, but they didn't have any iron. The Philistines who were in the land, they had the iron. 
which were the, the, the best weapons on the market of the day. They probably had copper, they probably had tin, but they weren't as strong as the Philistines' weapons. So that would be like going to war, you know, against a, a, an army today where you know that they've got far superior uh, aircraft or artillery or tanks. What are the what are the chances? Like Gideon with his 300 going against 135,000 Midianites. So uh, what weapons did God give the Israelites if the if they didn't have the right tools and material? Well, in Joshua chapter 1 verse 9, this is the armor. This is the weapon that the Lord gave them. Are you ready? He said from actually Joshua 1 from verse 5 to 9, he says, do not let this book depart from out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, for then you'll be prosperous and then you will be successful. Be strong and courageous. That's the weapons that the Lord gave his word. Be strong, be courageous. That's what you know, do, you need to do. But here's the greatest weapon that you need is God's word. See, God's word is filled with truth. When you go into the land, there's lies. The lies are you're small in your own eyes. We're bigger than you. We have the tools to make success. We have our gods bow. They give us more rain. They make our land more prosperous. These are all lies. But it, but when those lies start to attack you, you got to step up and fight these lies. Shake them off. And do not depart from this law. Meditate on it day and night. Then you'll be prosperous. Then you'll be successful. Keep moving forward. Every place that you put your foot it's yours. That's what the Lord said. So, and by the way, this was the Lord's success when he was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. How did he overcome the devil's lies? God's word. Three times he said to Satan, it is written. <clears throat> That's why when I go to certain places in the land, like for example, <clears throat> Tel Megiddo, they have a silo there. And what's a silo for, everyone? It's for storage. When are you most needing a storage room? When you're under siege. See, the enemies, you may have height advantage up in places like a Tel, Tel Megiddo, Tel Hatzor, Tel Beersheba. That's great that you've got the height advantage, but what your enemies will sometimes do is they will surround you and they will try to starve you and thirst you out. So if you've got storage, a silo, and that's why they built the water tunnels to bring the water into the city in case there was siege. When you've got these supplies under siege, you can draw on them. That's God's word, everyone. That's why we keep reading God's word anyway, and we store it up in our memory bank. That's what the Lord did when the devil attacked him for 40 days and 40 nights. He was able to draw on his storage of God's word and of course a big part of when we go out to fight is our prayer we go with that rod we go with our arms lifted up prayer god's word these are basic things but i think they're good things that we need to be reminded of so um i just want to finish everyone by uh, reverting to a um, a paper I read it. I read it, not read it. I read. That's a new English word, read it. And it's about, <clears throat> and it's so applicable, I believe, to today in the United States, in the UK, in Israel. It was a, um, it's a weapon that I call unity a weapon called unity. When you go out to fight, the weapon of unity, and that unity starts with our relationship with the Lord, relationships that are close to us, because I've seen it. 
One of the greatest strategies is the enemy to bring disunity, division. We turn against each other. We're fight Now we're fighting against that person instead of we're fighting for God's kingdom with that disunity. Now, let me just read. It's, it's not that long, but it's, there's some really key nuggets in it. And if you don't have the notes, uh, listen. But it, it's all about, remember when King David became the king of Israel, all the 12 tribes were unified. And this was one of the heights, the zenith heights of the history of Israel. This is about 1000 BC. King David, unity. What happened after David? Solomon. Solomon's kingdom was undoubtedly the golden age of Israel. The accomplishments of Solomon and the highlights of his reign include those things all kings and empires sought after, and most of them didn't actually obtain. A prominent feature of Solomon's rule was his preparation for defense. That's what we've been talking about today. He fortified key cities. Guys, that's what you and I have to do. We have to fortify these areas that we've been talking about today. Our identity, our kindness and our cruelness, and where we're hiding. You know, if we see our brother's donkey or ass go astray, we need to, you know, not hide. We need to step up. So, he fortified the key cities which ringed Israel's center, Hatzor, Megiddo, Gezer, Beit Horon, and Balat. He assembled as many as 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen, and he maintained 4,000 stables in which to house the horses. And he kept a large standing army, which required enormous amounts of food and other provisions. So really, in the natural Israel was, there's no way you can defeat it because he fortified, he had everything in store. So how did the divide, how did the kingdom become divided? How? Solomon also, uh, he had 12 divisions, 12 district and supervisors. He had a thousand wives and concubines. Here we go. Here we start to see the cracks. He had a thousand wives and concubines. Uh, a thousand wives and porcupines, I'm sorry, concubines, and probably had a large number of children to finance. Now, here we go. How, where do you get the money, everyone, to finance all of that? To finance such extensive programs, he developed at least three sources of national income. Number one, he taxed the people. It's like, it's, it would be like your church. You've got all these programs going on in the church, but you have to constantly say, guys, we need your money. We need your money. We need your money. Fine so far. Number one, taxation. Number two, some tribute and gifts were received from other nations, notably Sheba and Tyre. Trade relationships were developed with many areas, especially through Etzion Geba to the south and through Syria to the north. In addition, he used many aliens and Israelites in his building projects. So, so far, so good. He's got a lot of building. He's getting taxation from within and without. But, but don't forget, he's got the thousand wives and the concubines and many children. Solomon developed alliances with Egypt through his marriage to a daughter of Pharaoh and Tyre, Hiram I among others, and received official visits from many foreign dignitaries, including the Queen of Sheba. So now we have foreigners coming in to the scene of Solomon's life. His great building activities received much of his attention. It took him seven years to build the temple. During the next 13 years, now he builds his own palace and other fine buildings. Guys, why why did he build palace for himself? And why did he build fine buildings? This is a big question. Why? And the Milo, the supporting terraces, and part of the wall at Jerusalem. Solomon also apparently concentrated heavily on literary and philosophical pursuits. So Solomon was a bit of a cultural man, he loved philosophy. He loved reading. 
You know, David Ben-Gurion, the first pre prime minister of uh, Israel. Do you know, on average, he used to read 18 hours a day. 18 hours a day. He spoke about eight languages. Uh, uh, Hebrew, Arabic, Russian, Chinese. He taught himself to speak Chinese. Yiddish, English, maybe Polish, and maybe one more. Genius man, but he read. So, so far, not too bad, but he liked, he, he spread himself around. He became renowned for his wisdom and his writing of much wisdom literature in the Bible. Proverbs, for example. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and composed 1,005 songs. And of course, then he wrote the Song of All Songs, the book, the Song of Songs. Besides studying and analyzing much of nature, okay, he also studied the animals and the cruelty and all of that of animals and that kind of stuff. Top of page seven. How did Solomon's empire crumble, everyone? So I'm going to give you, and this is something that we have to fight against. The first point, it was jealousy. Jealousy. See, there were 12 tribes, but a lot of the things that Solomon did, they were in the two southern tribes. The tribes had always been jealous of their independency and rights. The tribal jealousy was actually the primary cause of the division of the monarchy. I read a whole article about this, uh, but I didn't. But because of time and detail, I, I I didn't put it in the notes. But the tribal jealousy, especially as I said, the temple was up in Jerusalem. They were the two southern tribes. That's the kingdom of Judah. The ten northern tribes, Israel. There was jealousy. He put a lot more effort, taxation, and money into the two southern tribes, including Jerusalem. So jealousy broke out. The 10 northern tribes, they felt less important. Number two, resentment and bitterness. The cry of the people in Israel in Rehoboam's day may provide a key to a major underlying cause of the division. When Rehoboam, Solomon's son, refused to listen to the plea of the people for an easier burden, they said to him and to each other, Listen to what they said. What portion do we ha have in David? They felt neglected. What portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now look after your own house, David. Do you see the resentment and the bitterness? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Go to your tents, O Israel. Look after your own house, David. And number three, a loss of passion and loyalty. A loss of passion and loyalty. The declaration of Sheba when he initiated a revolt under David. Listen to what Sheba said in 2 Samuel. We have no portion in David, nor do we have inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tent, O Israel. These statements are probably not direct, not declarations of war or slogans of active rebellion, but rather simply words of disbandment and a refusal to participate any further in the Davidic line and covenant. Maybe an, an analogy would be something, just imagine if you're, you go to a church, you've been in that church for, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years, you've been faithful, you've, you've tithed, you've supported, you've served in many ways, and all of a sudden, a young generation rises up and now all the finances uh, gets, gets allocated to the young people. And that's good. But you're neglected. That senior program that you're, you want to be part of or the middle-aged middle, middle age group, it's now neglected. And there's no finance. It's all going to the... And you, you start to say, but what about us? And you get totally neglected and this is what can happen in, 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 in churches and in families. It's, a, it's where the, the whole situation breaks down. And jealousy and resentment and bitterness 
rise up. Guys, we got to guard ourselves. We got to do battle against this. When if you if you're in a situation like that and you see those cracks in the unity start to appear, and maybe you're you may not be involved yourself, but you're seeing it in your church or in your family. This is where we've got to ask, Lord, can I do something? Am I hiding back? Do I need to step up or can I, you know, do I need to say something? Or maybe I can just pray about it. I'm going to go to war and start to pray about the situation. Solomon formed these 12 districts for the purpose of taxation and supplying the needs of his court. But he did not include Judah when he asked for taxation. He left Judah out. They didn't have to pay taxes. They got tax deductions. Judah apparently had tax-free status. Most of the district appointees were also Judahites or pro-Judahites. In addition, Sol Solomon's building projects were concentrated in Judah, where the temple was, the palace, the Milo, and the wall of Jerusalem. So, you know, uh, at the bottom of page six, David Ben-Gurion, the former prime minister of Israel, he lays most of the blame for the division of the kingdom at Solomon's door. I quote what Ben-Gurion says. I see the matter as follows. Solomon, during his latter years, adopted an increasingly oppressive policy. True, he introduced foreign trade and increased the national income to a very great extent. But his wisdom seemed to have failed him in the last days when his hand grew heavy upon the people. After all, 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horsemen and considerable Infantry were a burdensome yoke in those days. So what did he do, everyone? He put too much emphasis on one thing and he neglected another thing. He lost the balance. So that's a good point that you and I can go to fight for. Balance in life. This is what we have to fight all the time. And then coming up, and, and I'm not going to go and read it all, everyone, because uh, I don't want it to go on and, and be too laborious. But Solomon, uh, he, uh, he needed more and more wealth to maintain his huge government. Solomon, and by the way, he it's you know how he wanted to be the king? You know how the Israelites, they prayed to God, give us a king, give us a king. It wasn't wrong that they had a king, but. They said in 1 Samuel 8, 19 and 20, give us a king like the nations. That was the problem. Not a king, but a king like the nation. And all of this, everyone, led Solomon into apostasy. We look at David. His life was a life of conviction. Solomon's life was a life of compromise. Some people even say that when he prayed his prayer of dedication at the temple, that it may not have been his true convictions, but perhaps he was simply mouthing words he had heard his father and the priests use. Along with his wealth came this moral deterioration and religious apostasy, since his many wives turned his heart aside to other gods. <clears throat> there we go. It's the woman's fault. No, I'm joking. But in this case, it was the many wives that led his heart astray. <clears throat> Solomon permitted the thinking of and customs of other nations to influence his decisions, but these many marriages to foreign women uh, caused compromise. So in summary, everyone, <clears throat> the Lord's explanation for the division of the kingdom is given at the end of page 7, in 1 Kings 11, now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Notice that. God appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. So the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this, and you have not kept my commandment, my covenant and my statutes, which I've commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and I'll give it to your servant. Friends, Solomon got bogged down. He got bogged down with too many things. 
And you know, you you know how it is when you get too busy. These are all things that we need to fight against. These are things that, and even even serving the Lord. You know, uh, I've been so busy here in the states. Even serving the Lord can keep you out of balance, where you neglect that altar, you neglect that quiet time, and you end up doing the fighting and not the Lord. So these are things when you go out to fight. Our passage in Deuteronomy 21, when you go out to fight, these are things that we constantly be got to be, be fighting against to keep the balance and to keep the unity. And this is what, and I finish by saying, this was our Lord's high priestly prayer in John 17 when he prayed. He said, Father, I pray that they would have love and that they would have unity. May we strive. May we fight yeah. for love. May we. So he started an hour and a half ago. May we fight for unity. And uh, let me just uh, pause. Um, not pause. Mute. May oh. we fight for unity. Saturdays and, at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, hang on. Can whoever that is? I can't find whoever that is to mute. The normal John, part. Trent, Trent, can you can you mute Trent? Uh, uh, no, I can't. I'm not host. Okay, I got it. I got it. It's all good. Um, uh, I was just finishing anyway, guys, by saying let's fight these things and keep the unity and keep our identity and take out any of those ashes from the, the camp, anything uh, symbolic of death and uh, rise up. We got a fight on our hands, everyone. We got a fight for our nations for well let's start by we're, we're fighting for ourselves we're fighting for our families we're fighting for our communities we're fighting for our nation may god turn things around you know it, it only needed 300 in the time of gideon uh and uh if you read history of some revivals that have been going on it starts with ones twos small numbers the lord he began with one then three, then 12, then 70, then 120, then 3,000, then 5,000, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, thank you, everyone. Amen. Not only in John, but also in Psalm 133, Hine matov humanaim shevedagim gam yahad. Behold, how pleasant is for brothers and sisters to, to dwell together in unity, and I believe that's God's heart. And also, you mentioned, uh, Aaron, about the churches where where people were there 20, 30 years and they're used to one thing, and then all of a sudden young people come in and everything changes. Doesn't that sound like the movie Jesus Revolution that we saw recently? Uh, sounds just like it. And then uh, and then God just broke loose with, with, uh, with everything as far as that was concerned, as far as revival. So... Praise God. It was a good teaching. Thank Praise you, brother. Yeah, you're welcome. <clears throat> Thank you, Gary. If anyone has a comment or a question, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, go for it. Well, I've uh, had some thoughts about unity. Um, it's difficult when I find brothers and sisters going to churches that really don't support Israel or that maybe endorse replacement theology and those kinds of situations are difficult. Just wanted to mention that. Um, yeah. So yeah. that's a tough one, Kathy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you do in cases like that? Do you, it's like we read when you see your, your donkey or your, your ox go astray, don't hide, but, but go and, when you see things like that, what do you do? Do you approach? Do you pray? Do you talk to the leaders? Mm -hmm. um, you know, to fight against that, because that's a that's a, a, a an unscriptural doctrine. I'm sure, you, well, well, sure you know about that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yes. good good example. Very good yes. example. And that's huge. Unfortunately, that's huge in the church in these last days. Mm hmm. It is. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. And good to there see you. One, one other quick comment. Um, 
uh, I was uh, researching the seat seat issue because I knew a, a woman um, who was wearing seat seat. And when I looked at the passage, and I don't have the benefit of knowing the Hebrew roots, but it, it appeared that it was not a sexual, I mean, it, it didn't specify from what I could read. It didn't seem to specify men. It seemed to be more general. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? You mean the, the commandment to wear? To wear tzitzit, yes. That it said, it seemed to me like it was not specifying men, but it was specifying, you know, more general, like men or women, but maybe it was implying men. I don't know if you anybody has any thoughts on that. Um, uh, I don't have the Hebrew in front of me, but based on the hundreds and hundreds of years of it being a you know male uh practice mm -hmm. i i would imagine it it's it's in the in the masculine mm -hmm. uh, but but that's okay that's okay that doesn't mean that it's wrong for women to wear tzitzit -tzit. personally i don't have a problem at all mm -hmm. uh with women wearing tzitzit -tzit, mm -hmm. um even if it is in the masculine mm -hmm. uh Yep. Yeah. Thank you. If you're trying to say something and I don't think we can hear. Hello. Here we go. Now we can hear you. <laughs> I just wanted to um, comment. So first of all, the teaching is so rich. There is so much here and I love the digging in and then you know, looking into the practical application. And I think I, I mentioned to you about, you know, I mentor women. So there is just some great pearls that come out of what you share. <clears throat> and I thank God for you. Um, one of the things that really struck me when you were talking about we're fighting against that darkness and that father of lies. And I, I, I came across a commentary some time ago, can't even tell you who it was, but they were pointing out in Genesis 3 where, you know, Satan approaches Eve and he asked her the question, you know, that basically, I'm paraphrase here, did God really say? And the point they made was that Satan is not all knowing, but that he has to get a hold of what the truth is to be able to distort and twist the truth. Mm. And so asking Eve the question gave him the full truth that he didn't have. And that out of that, he was able to twist it. I just thought that really struck me when I heard that back then that, you mm. know, he doesn't have all the truth. Mm. He doesn't have all the knowledge but he comes at us to get it and then turns around and twists it. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for that comment, Kathy. Very, very good observation. Yeah. He doesn't care whether it's little truth or all the truth. And sometimes he will use the whole truth. Like he even quoted scripture mm -hmm. um, uh, to Yeshua. Of course, it's out of context truth. There yeah. you go. Right. That's what he will do out of context. So thank you, Kathy. Appreciate that. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> no, we can't hear you. We cannot hear you. Let me try to unmute. Um, unmute. Why can't I not unmute? There you go. You got it. I, I like what Kathy said. And I, Kathy, I think, you know, the enemy knows more about scripture than we do, but you know, in order to speak the lies, you have to know the truth. You know, he knew he knows the truth, but everything that comes out of his mouth is lies because he he knows the truth, in my opinion. Yeah, well, but does he know the whole truth? That was the point no. Kathy made. But yeah, so um, who uh, who was trying to say something? And they Karen. Were, yeah, Karen, there you are, Karen. Karen. We okay. can't we can't see your face, Karen. We can well, see if I got my mouth closed, <clears throat> you can't see my face. <laughs> Oh, I got it. Okay, well, we can hear you. Thank you. Yes, I thought that was more important. 
anyway, um, you know that verse in the Bible where it says, unless the days be shortened, the, the elect would not survive. Mm. And I have been wondering about that because my, I can keep going. I used to be able to clean the house weekly, you know, and just all this kind of stuff I used to do, take care of the kids, used to go to work for 80 hours a week, you know, and I can't do it anymore. And I was wondering if that has something to do with it. what God is doing is shortening the days. And I thought, how would he do that? Well, all he'd have to do is just shorten the 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 rotation and make it go faster around. But people would know it because it still be 24 hours in our day. What do you think? Wow, that's an interesting theory. <laughs> I wondered about that. But it, but it, yeah. I don't know about that, but it is interesting. It just seems as you get older, the days are faster. They they seem to be shorter, but no, obviously they're not. They that maybe Paul, uh, maybe Paul, you have some as a scientist, you you have some insights into that. I don't, Paul. Anything? Uh, on the days getting shorter. Yeah. Uh, it. My my understanding, and but it's so minuscule that it probably doesn't matter. Well, the reason I wondered it was the rotation tends to, is ten days would be. To me. Hang on, hang on, hang on, uh, Paul. Yeah. Paul, can you say that again? You froze on us. Say that again. Uh, my internet's been giving me trouble today. Um, my understanding is that the Earth is uh, rotation is actually slowing down, and I think that's. Um, it's minuscule, so nobody notices it. Um, and I always took the days would be short and would be, he cuts off, he cuts off time as opposed to actually shortening the day, but the number of days. Mm. Interesting. I, we just got a text mm. from Francis saying some prophets say we only have 16 hours now. Definitely feels like it sometimes. There could be some... I don't know. I, I, I'm like Paul. I don't know enough. Any other well, comments? As we get older, there, there. I mean, as we get older, our sense of time certainly speeds up. I, I remember. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I remember uh, a study that was done. My daughter was doing summer research, and she had to present her data at school, and there was somebody else doing that, and and they actually did timing older people, and and they would time how much do you think is a minute, and and our time goes fast. Seem, feels like it's going faster um and mm. it, it it seems to be a reality but what the cause of that is i don't know and i'm not sure how it impacts our ability to get things done other than i seem a lot slower than i used to be mm. yeah well it's funny thanks thanks karen for that question um it's funny because yesterday i drove from memphis to knoxville and what I didn't know is when you drive from Memphis, which is central time, you cross into Knoxville, which is Eastern time. And I lost an hour. So my day definitely was shorter <laughs> yesterday. And I didn't know that that would happen. And I had an engagement dinner and I was a little late. So anyhow, <laughs> any other questions? If I could just make a quick comment. <laughs> And you might appreciate this, Aron, that my daughter and her husband flew to New Zealand a few years ago. And on the day of their flight, it was her birthday. And of course, going from here to there, you lose a day. So she right. lost her birthday. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's on to that all year. <laughs> I know. That's how it is. The, 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 the time difference is crazy. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks, so everyone. One of the things that I thought of, I mean, very early on, and we've heard it a lot, you know, it's the it's the world, the flesh, and the devil. And it seems like spiritual warfare is intensifying. And uh, as we enter into Elul and look towards the Yom Kippur, and the church tends to ignore it, but I, I see this as a, a time to defeat the world and the flesh so that we're better able to fight the devil. And and so if we're fighting all three at one time, it's like Israel fighting uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, and uh, Houthis all at one time. If they can defeat Hamas and then they can defeat, defeat 
one of the others, then the effort can go uh, uh, at one entity. And so that's, a, it, I, that's something I've been looking at, but you, your teaching kind of put it into a clarity that we need to spend this time in God's calendar to defeat in our lives the world and the flesh because the intensity of spiritual warfare to me is really intensifying. Agree. Oh. I think you're muted, Donna. Uh, you're muted, Aharon. Yeah, sorry about that. I Someone phoned me. Uh, all I said is thanks, Paul. That's a lot what you just said. That was packed. That was loaded. Anyone else want to well, comment? Just as a quick follow up to that, yesterday afternoon, I was I had listened to something um, on social media that was very disturbing, and I had been listening. I we tend to over listen to the news, and I had just had it, and so I just said, okay, I'm not necessarily a a as a Shabbat observer to, you know, I do a little bit, but um, I just said, okay, I'm turning off all media. And I just uh, listened to Marty Getz, my, one of my favorite Messianic singers. And I just really needed that to, you know, reconnect and just, um, yeah. So I just wanted to mention that we, I just really needed to, to disengage for a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Excellent. And you know what, that's, that's what it, that's really taking it down to grassroots, <clears throat> being in touch with our senses, being with our, in touch with ourselves so that we can discern what, what we need. You know, the, the Lord, he said to the disciples, he said, come, up, come aside for a season, you know, for, for rest um, and, and to know what, what we, we need. We've got we to gotta look after ourselves. We've got a war. Uh, fatigue is a, is a killer. And um, so thank you for sharing that. And by the way, I was just talking to someone yesterday uh, who, who invited me out. They, they went to a Marty Getz concert, mm -hmm. li a live concert recently, and they said it was uh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, he has a special anointing, I feel. So. Mm, yes, absolutely. Well, Good, everyone. Well, thank you for your comments. And uh, we're going to pray. Um, and then Gary's going to bless us with the ironic blessing. Can I just say uh, a special welcome to a few people that are here for the first time? Welcome. Uh, we send out notes each week, before, like a day or two before the Bible. So if you want to be on that list, um, you can email me and I'll, I'll make sure you get uh, those notes. So... Um, and we'll carry on Deuteronomy next week. I think we've got about another three lessons before we begin again, Genesis. Yeah. Father God, thank you so much for your word, for these warnings, these equippings, these uh, nuggets that we get uh, from 3,000 plus years ago. And they are so applicable and relevant to our lives today in the 21st century. And so, Lord, uh, strengthen us by your word that we can do what Joshua said. Be strong and be courageous. Do not let this book of the Lord depart from out of our mouths, but meditate on it day and night. Then we'll be prosperous. Then we will be successful. Lord, may we uh, fight against some of the things that we talked about, the imbalance, the mixing, the assimilation, the, uh, the pride, uh, whatever it is, the jealousy, Lord, uh, and may we step up when we need to step up and not hide when we see our brother go astray or our sister go astray. Uh, and when we uh, need to speak, Lord, give us that unction. And when we need to be silent and just pray, Lord, may we pray with faith in all these things, Lord, we ask that you would give us wisdom, give us the wisdom uh, that comes from the spirit of the living God, the spirit that comes from the anointing of the Mashiach, the anointed one, Yeshua, our Messiah, Messiah, our Savior, the one who died and bled and suffered for us, but that you raised from the dead and he lives and intercedes for us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Yeah. Brother, only a couple more weeks till the Moedim.
you know, to the high holidays, but not too yes. far. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you, Catherine. God bless. Great to see you. You too. So I want to, before I do the ironic blessing, I just want to close with this word. Um, I've mentioned this on chat, but I think it's worth repeating. We know that the day is coming when all nations will gather to battle against Israel. But Yeshua, the Messiah, will fight for Israel and gain the victory. All the spoils of the nations will come into the hands of the people of Israel. And that day, we will, we will receive back, and then when I'm talking about Israel, we'll receive back all that the enemy has stolen from us. God will restore the years that the swarming locusts have devoured. That's mm -hmm. Joel 325. And we will receive a double portion in our land. Instead of your shame, you'll receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so, so you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. And to that I say, amen, amen, amen. 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 If you guys can please unmute, receive the blessing of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Looking forward for you to being back in Israel, brother. Yeah, same here. Thank you. Yivarechecha Adonai v'dish medecha, Ya'er Adonai p'navalecha v'echonecha, Yisad Adonai p'navalecha, Yisem Elcha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his God upon each and every one of you and free it overflowing with his peace within Shalom. B'shem Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of our Lord, Jesus the Messiah. And in the name of our Lord, Moshenu our Redeemer. Tell you it's wonderful counselor. El Gibor, mighty God, Aviad, everlasting Father, Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. Adonai Rafeka, the Lord who heals, restores, and makes whole. Ari Yehuda, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Avino Mokenu, our Father and our King. Avino Shabbat Shemayim, our Father who is in heaven. Melech mm HaOlam, -hmm. our eternal King. El Shaddai, our all sufficient God. And Adonai Nisi, the Lord yes. is our refuge and our banner. Mm -hmm. And all of God's people says, Amen. 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 And hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Gary. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. And um, love travels Aharon. Yeah, Thank it's, you it's so right much. Right I'm going back to the Holy Land. But by the way, uh, a, a, a couple of days ago, I was in this area of the United States which was filled with grace. It's called Graceland. I was in Memphis, oh, uh, gosh, Tennessee, oh my and, I, gosh. and I drove Going past Graceland. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go. I'll go <laughs> next time. I, was, I didn't want to go by myself. So. Oh, she's oh. got the Elvis on. Oh, there's Catherine. <laughs> the yeah, good That's job, perfect. Catherine. <laughs> That's so oh, funny. Yeah. Oh. All right. That was Bless good. Yeah, we'll do that. Have fun. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye, Aaron. Bless you guys. Take care. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. There we go.